people's right of self-determination. And it's interesting your presentation tonight uh, because we are, I'm sure you're well aware that we are having a military build-up uh, to begin uh, basically in 2010 and ending by 2014. Um, do you have strategies um, to use uh, for the United Nations? Because although it is still a forum, uh, a lot of mandates come out of the UN, and I notice your uh, designation of universal uh, declaration rather than universal human rights. Um, we go up there because we're we're seeking um, decolonization, as you as you well know. Guam is a non-self-governing territory, uh, and I'm wondering whether um, we can take this kind of a presentation and, and take it to that level. Um, yeah, what, those what I'm saying is that um, while indeed uh, after the Second World War, self-determination beca became the pivotal uh, concern, especially of peoples who were uh, under the yoke of uh, colonization, there's still some others who had discrete languages, discrete cultures and mores, wanted to govern by themselves. And now there are more and more uh, ways of accommodating this without necessarily catapulting them to the nation state category. And so, you know, this is a continuing challenge um, in the case of uh, Spain, for example, or in our case, uh, we continue to uh, be challenged by what political form the Moros uh, in Mindanao would like to take at the same time that they are still working within the configuration of the territory of the Republic. Um, I think the, it would be a, a series of accommodation, really, between these two groups because, you know, we can argue ourselves black and blue in the face and then be no end uh, to this argument. Uh, because for as long as the government in Manila would refuse to identify a separate uh, political entity, uh, there will be no end to uh, the, the conflict. I guess it's the same all over the world in regard to the self-determinations of other uh, groups. But that said, um, as we see, the economies are already so enmeshed. The old forms of production and the distribution already are going beyond the, the, the political boundaries as we knew it. And unfortunately, it's not, uh, the political configuration is not matching the economic configuration. And so that is what uh, we need to deal with too. So is territory, does territory still loom large in terms of our personhood? Uh, we have interviewed many young Muslims in the Philippines, they're engineers, they're architects. And so we asked them, how do you feel about this uh, juridical entity that they want to set up in Mindanao? And they said territory will not be something that will uh, make them not move just because there is that entity. I mean, if he's an architect and his services will be, let us say, uh, wanted in Singapore or elsewhere, he will go there. But I think what we need to pay attention to is we need to... Uh, uh, pay due attention to the history of uh, the past of the Muslims, to the ancestral domain that uh, the Muslims continue to claim. And that one, I think, should be granted. It's still within the purview of the respect for the integrity of the Republic. So there's a happy uh, compromise if Manila is willing to do that. But my view is a minority view, unfortunately. The idea that we only can create peace through social economic uh, development goes back decades and when we read certain documents from the 60s and 70s that have asking that in the, within the United Nations or alliances of churches who have tried the non-profit activist groups who have been trying to convince political leaders around the world that we only can achieve peace through development. What's your interpretation why that idea didn't really catch through? Why didn't was not why did this idea not being wasn't embraced or I guess my answer to that would be to give the example of Mindanao, uh, which I'm quite familiar with. There so many administrations tried tried to put a lot of resources uh, in Mindanao, paying attention to the economic development uh, framework. But uh, still, we are confronted with a, uh, with a continuing insurgency there, and the, the place continues to be not a place where economic activity can happen. And why? Because we forgot 
the social justice part. So even while you know we poured in money, investments, many many uh, foreign organizations, in fact, tried to help Mindanao in the economic arena in terms of the development. That other part, which is social justice, continued to grind so slowly. And um, I think uh, that one has to be addressed by a new president, which we will have uh, in a few months now. Because it is not enough to just, uh, you know, just pour money there. You know, we in Manila already are protesting that uh, the rest of the country has been neglected because so much money is going to uh, Mindanao on a per, per capita basis. And Mindanao, yes, is uh, the, the, practically the concentration of our natural resources are there. All the precious minerals and ores are in Mindanao. Ironically. Dr. Carlos, uh, Mabuhay, and uh, Mabuhay. half a day. Uh, welcome to Guam. My name is Maria Claret Ruain. I'm a professor here at UOT in, in my third year. I'm a, I'm a Filipino American. And my question to you is, actually it's a comment and a question. Um, one of the slides that you showed talked about extrem extremist, extremist group or extremism uh, uh, emanating from not being able to provide basic needs to the population. So my, my question to you is, I look at Mindanao as exactly one that, uh, that, that is described as such. Because when I was teaching at the University of the Philippines School of Economics uh, in 1995 to 98, I actually was involved in the United Nations project, which estimated the human development index, uh, the scoring system for the Philippines. And we did that also for the provinces. And it's very clear, I like to have the numbers tell me the story. And in fact, when you talk about a very basic statistic such as life expectancy, where it's as high as 84 years old, in, in Metro Manila, if you live in Metro Manila, you could expect to live up to 84 years old. The statistics for Mindanao is less than 50 years old, which really tells you the, 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 uh, the harsh condition that, that, that is happening in the region. And it's not to justify the frustration and, uh, and the extremism there, but it certainly, it gives you, it, it, it puts things in perspective. We, we identify really the vulnerabilities there. You know, when we were in Mulo, the first day we were there, the, uh, the water was up to our knees. The fourth day we were there, we were there for four days. And on the fourth day, the water was still up to there. And we asked uh, why this is so, and the water can very well go to the sea and uh, dissipate. And we were informed that the, the mayor himself had put up structures to block all the steros, you know, the pathways uh, to the sea. So it, the local government itself is the one uh, uh, responsible for the hardship of the people. And these things that I, I gave you, this came from our own uh, uh, investigation in those areas. The people really wanted just basic things, you know, potable water so their children will not have uh, all the kinds of diseases. They want their education to continue. They're not running every two weeks because they need to be evacuated because of the military operations. So, so my question to you is, since you actually pinpointed it, you have a population that's hostage to a local, a local government that doesn't deliver ba their basic needs. Um, the U.S., I view, is, is caught in a dilemma of being um, a wealthy nation with economic and political power. And when you have a lo a, a, an area that's being neglected by its own government, uh, this, people in this area tend to call out to the international community.